From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew. An historic day in lower Manhattan as Donald Trump's criminal hush money case goes to trial. We'll get an update from the courthouse and speak with former federal prosecutor Jessica Roth. The world waits for a response from Israel today after Iran attacked the country with hundreds of missiles and drones over the weekend, 99 percent of which were blocked by Israeli and allied defenses. Deputy Pentagon Press Secretary Sabrina Singh will join us to talk about the operation. As Republican House members gather this hour to chart the way forward on funding for both Israel and Ukraine, we'll be joined by the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, Adam Smith of Washington, with us today on Balance of Power. And we thank you for joining us as we begin with the criminal trial of former President Donald Trump. A first, the judge in that case ruling that jurors can hear evidence related to Trump's alleged affair with a former Playboy model, the former president speaking outside the courthouse after the conclusion for the day a short time ago. Here he is. As you know, next Thursday, we're before the United States Supreme Court at a very big hearing on immunity. And this is something that we've been waiting for a long time. And the judge, of course, is not going to allow us. He's a very conflicted judge. And he's not going to allow us to go to that. He won't allow me to leave here for a half a day, go to D.C. and go before the United States Supreme Court. I can't go to my son's graduation or that I can't go to the United States Supreme Court, that I'm not in Georgia or Florida or North Carolina campaigning like I should be. Now the first former American president to sit for a criminal trial, Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines is outside the courthouse in lower Manhattan for us today. Kaylee, what's it like there? Well, it's certainly been a lively day here in Lower Manhattan, Joe, as this first day of proceedings kicked off. Of course, it was intended to be jury selection that started, which it did, but rather late in the day. There was a number of proceedings that they had to get out of the way first, including a number of motions filed by the defense. The defense asking for this judge, Juan Mershon, to recuse himself. He denied that request, and of course, he also had to make decisions as to what could be submitted into evidence, as you mentioned. Then they began the process of jury selection. Ninety-six potential jurors were brought into the courtroom on the 15th floor uh, of this building behind me and more than half of them when asked if they could be impartial or biased and if not raise your hand did so and were excused that is just how difficult it is going to be to actually get an unbiased jury of 12 uh, of the former president's peers and six alternates who will need to assess this case given of course he has incredibly high name recognition as a former president and the presumptive republican nominee it's interesting as well when we're considering timeline here the judge uh, did say at the when wrapping the readings today that they are way behind schedule and there was one juror a potential juror who said he has his son's wedding in Seattle on June 8th the judge rec uh, recused him saying that he couldn't be sure essentially that the trial was going to be wrapped up by then so while initially Joe we thought these proceedings proceedings could take six to eight weeks it potentially could be a whole lot longer than that Kaylee, thank you. It's great to have you there for us today. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines normally at my side here in Washington. Turning to our other top story now, Israel's military chief says there will be a response to Iran's attacks against them over the weekend. President Biden spoke at the White House earlier today about the U.S. government's commitment to help Israel. Iran launched an unprecedented aerial attack against Israel, and we mounted an unprecedented military effort to defend Israel. Together with our partners, we defeated that attack. The United States is committed to Israel's security. We're committed to a ceasefire that will bring the hostages home and preventing conflict from spreading beyond what it already has. We're joined now by the Pentagon's Deputy Press Secretary, Sabrina Singh. It's great to see you back on Bloomberg, and I know that the administration is marking, if not celebrating, a resounding success here in blocking 99 percent of the hardware that Iran put up in the sky on Saturday night. But if Israel does, in fact, decide on a military answer, Sabrina, will the U.S. support Israel in that mission? 
Well, thanks so much for having me on today. Look, that's really a decision that Israel has to make. Why we, why our U.S. forces are in the Middle East right now, uh, we have our enduring uh, mission that uh, exists in Syria and Iraq to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. But we're also in the Middle East right after October 7th. Uh, the secretary, the president, uh, made the decision to surge assets into the region to send a message that we want to de deter actors who want to take advantage of what happened on October 7th. Uh, we do not want to see this, this war that's happening in Israel, happening in Gaza, widen out to a regional conflict. So that's why we have our assets in the region. And exactly as you said, those assets uh, over the weekend uh, were able to knit together an incredibly uh, strong response in our air defense with the IDF and with other partner nations to knock down some 300 uh, drones and ballistic and cruise missiles that were shot in the direction of Israel. Mm -hmm. So we are really proud of our efforts and what we were able to accomplish over the weekend. Well, by all means, and if there is, in fact, a military response, then the U.S. is not saying publicly that it will support Israel either through the military operations or by sharing intelligence in that mission. Is that safe to say then? Yeah, you know, I just don't have anything for you on that. That's really a decision that Israel is going to have to make. What I can tell you and what we've expressed both publicly and privately in the secretary's calls with his counterpart, Minister Gallant, and in other calls throughout this department and really the administration, is that we do not want to see a wider regional conflict. And we, the United States, mm -hmm. does not seek war with Iran. Pretty remarkable uh, to see the results on Saturday night. And there has been uh, this refrain that we've heard, Sabrina, I'm sure you've heard this as well, that Iran might not have tried this if it thought it could, in fact, more effectively penetrate Israel's air defenses. This is something that John Kirby talked about today at the White House National Security Council spokesman. Let's listen to what he said. And we'll have you respond. Here's John Kirby. I've seen reporting that the Iranians meant to fail. That this spectacular and embarrassing failure was all by design. I've also seen uh, Iran say that they provided early warning to help Israel prepare its defenses and limit any potential damage. All of this is categorically false. To coin the phrase from the president, or still a phrase from the president, it's malarkey. If it was not meant to fail then, Sabrina, did the U.S. have confidence that it would be able to knock down that many missiles and rockets? Or did we learn something about our capability this past weekend? Well, look, you can never predict as an, opera as an operation starts or an is ongoing how successful it will be. But what you saw is the capability of our forces, and especially our forces united together. You saw the IDF, U.S. forces, the U.K., France, other partners join in together in the self-defense of Israel. Uh, that really speaks volumes um, to our alliance there and our, our ironclad commitment to Israel. And look, we were successful. We were able to knock down 99 percent of what Iran lobbed towards Israel. And that really is a true testament to our own military capabilities and Iran's failures. And I think to what John Kirby was speaking to at the podium at the White House is Iran right now uh, sees its failures and they're trying to spin this and use their propaganda machine to try and sell this to their people that this was a, a, a success. And the reality is, is that uh, there was no damage to infrastructure. You know, we are still assessing um, what we were able to do. But the fact is that we demonstrated tremendous success on Saturday. And that is a, an incredible victory for Israel and for the United States. Mm -hmm. well, it was a question of whether that success is a deterrent in itself. And I talked today with Alex uh, Vatanko, who's the Middle East Institute's director of the Iran program. He spoke with us on the earlier edition of balance of power about that very issue, Sabrina. Here's what he told us. They don't feel if they get into a conflict with, with Israel, then that's the end of it. They feel that a conflict with Israel means a conflict with the United States. And in many ways, they're right in yeah. thinking that. That is their position. And they don't dare. Uh, you know, you can put another thousand sanctions on the Islamic Republic, they wouldn't blink. But you start seriously talking about the use of the United States military against Iran, that's when they're gonna really seriously back away. Sabrina Singh, you've said a couple of times now that it is up to Israel the course that it's going to take here, and I completely understand that. But would Iran be correct, as we just heard from Alex, to assume that the United States will always be behind Israel? Well, you've heard the president say it very publicly, that our commitment to Israel is ironclad. 
But that means in its self-defense as well. And that's what you saw over the weekend. That's what you saw us engage in when we had tremendous air power up there in the skies and, of course, our destroyers out um, in the eastern Mediterranean. And when we say our commitment to Israel is ironclad, that also means um, supporting them and with our military assistance, the security assistance that they need in their ongoing fight with Hamas, which is still operating in Gaza. And that also means the U.S. commitment to making sure that humanitarian aid is getting into Gaza. So when we say our commitment to Israel is ironclad, that means that it has broad ramifications for exactly the security assistance that we provide, but also the humanitarian assistance that we are providing to the Palestinian people, who we know are in desperate and dire need of that assistance in Gaza right now. I know our commander of U.S. Central Command, General Eric Carrillo, yeah. was sent to Israel in advance of this operation. Sabrina, is he still there, or do we have a similar authority on the ground in Israel to work with them through the next steps? Well, General Carrillo was always scheduled to travel to the region. As you just mentioned, he is the commander of the Central Command Area of Responsibility. He did move up his yep. travel as, you know, tensions are are arising, and, and he wanted to ensure that while we stand with Israel, we also have partners in the region, we have our forces in the region, so giving them a show of support as well. So it was important for him to be there. Um, I believe he's still traveling through the region, meeting with his counterparts as well. That's not unusual, and that's something that we certainly are, are glad that he's on the ground. Um, I think what his priority is also focused on is making sure that we're getting that floating pier up and running into Gaza that will help uh, get humanitarian aid and really flood the zone in from a different point of entry into Gaza. So that's something that I know he's also focused on while he's in the region. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Sabrina. I know that's yeah. uh, a military operation. Is that something you can give us an update on in terms of timing? Are you making progress on that pier? We are making progress. Um, we will be working. We hope to be set up and fully operational by the end of April, early May. That's about the timeline that we set up from the very beginning. I think about 60 days from when the president announced it at the State of the Union. Um, so we feel confident in that timeline. And look, if anything were to slide a little bit, we would certainly keep um, you know you and your viewers updated on that. Um, but it is a priority of this department to make sure that we get that floating pier set up so that we can get trucks moving in, um, coming into, into Gaza. And, of course, we've also reiterated with the Israelis that they need to open those land routes. They need to make sure that aid can flow in from Ashdod and other places um, so we can flood the zone in Gaza. We, we just cannot see this humanitarian situation get worse. Um, we need we know that Hamas continues to operate within within Gaza. They do have brigades in Rafah. But right now, what we need to focus on is making sure that people aren't going and starving. And so one of the things that you're seeing the military do is helping with those humanitarian efforts. Um, and hopefully we'll have that peer underway in the next few weeks. With the view from the Pentagon, Sabrina Singh, we thank you for coming back to talk to us today on Bloomberg. Coming up, we'll be joined by former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York, Jessica Roth, as we return to the topic the first day of the criminal trial of former President Trump in New York. It's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Each prospective juror has all sorts of complications and the lawyers have to sort of sort out what they think will be the best approach to everything and then make determinations of how to attack each or how to select a juror. Former federal prosecutor Michael Zeldin talking with us earlier today on Bloomberg. The trial of Donald Trump has recessed for the day with the judge saying that they are, quote, way behind schedule. It's day one. Let's bring in former federal prosecutor with the Southern District of New York and law professor at Cardozo University, Jessica Roth. It's great to see you, Professor. Thanks for being with us. We've talked so much about this moment. We are finally here. A bit of maneuvering on both sides today and a late start for jury selection. I come back to the original prospect of this being a six-week trial, knowing how many people were dismissed already today. Uh, how long is this actually going to take? in this historic first criminal trial of a former president? So this is a historic trial. There's no question about it. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's going to take a while to choose a jury here. Uh, one, of the one of the decisions that the judge made about the jury selection process 
is that he said he's going to excuse jurors who self-identify as being unable to serve in this case, either because they have a hard uh, scheduling commitment that can't be changed um, or because they think that they cannot be fair and impartial jurors here. And he said that if they so self-identify, he's going to excuse them without further questioning. Um, and so we saw the consequences of that decision today. Uh, I think about 50 jurors so self-identified out of the about 98 who were initially uh, brought into the courtroom for the, to begin this process. And so, you know, many fewer left to even begin the individual questioning. Um, and so if that continues at that pace, uh, the court is going to lose a lot of potential jurors simply because they yeah. self-identify as being unable to serve in this case. Now, there are good reasons why the judge made that decision. Um, he thought it would be more efficient, and it was the same method that he used in the Trump Organization criminal trial a little while back, mm -hmm. uh, where he said that he found people who so self-identified upon further questioning, it turned out that they were excused for cause. And so he said, let's just dispense with that individual questioning with this group this time around um, in the interest of efficiency. But it does mean they're going to have okay. to go through many more potential jurors um, in order to find 12 jurors who can serve and six alternates who will then go through that additional screening process and be deemed ultimately uh, qualified jurors to serve in this extraordinary case. Well, I guess I'm trying to figure out if this saves time. Is that a more efficient process or does it add time because they need more people? It's, it's hard to say at the end of the day. It's probably more efficient at the end of the day because He's not going to have to do individual questioning of all of those people who so self-identify. Um, there also was the logistical challenge of where would they do that questioning when you had a lot of jurors still waiting to go through this process, given that not only do you have the parties here and their lawyers, but you have Secret Service agents who are there to protect the former president. And so that was one of the logistical difficulties that drove the court to make this decision, that there was simply no space in which it was feasible to accommodate all of those who needed to be present for the individual questioning mm -hmm of those jurors. So probably at the end of the day, it was a smart decision, but it does mean we're probably going to churn through more jurors, more potential jurors, more quickly. Okay. I think about three people were left as potential jurors at the end of the day that started with 98. Unbelievable. So this is a bit of a grind. There were a few rulings before he ever even got to jury selection or the start of it. The judge refused to recuse himself. That's one. Also ruled that Karen McDougal will be allowed to testify in that trial. How significant is that? So I think the evidentiary rulings that the judge has made thus far, including today, are fair and sound. Um, for example, Karen McDougal is going to be permitted to testify about her alleged affair with the former president and the payment that she received um, not to sell her story. And that makes sense because it's all part of the larger narrative here about the so-called catch and kill scheme um, that the National Enquirer was allegedly part of with Trump to essentially silence stories that were negative for Trump as he went into his presidential campaign. And so I think it's appropriate that the jury hear about that larger narrative but at the same time, the judge also ruled that really uh, significant evidence will not be admitted against the former president. And so, for example, with respect to the Access Hollywood tape that was released just a couple of weeks before the presidential election in 2016, in which Trump can be heard uh, essentially bragging about sexually assaulting women and getting away with it because he's famous, the judge ruled that the jury can hear testimony about that tape because it sets up the narrative that the payment was made to Stormy Daniels immediately after in order to essentially assure up his campaign prospects um, in the wake of that Access Hollywood tape. But the jury will not yeah. see the videotape because the judge said that would be too prejudicial. And so I think the judge is striking a fair balance, letting the jury hear the larger story that the, st the state is trying to tell while making sure that the defendant here, former President Trump, will not be unfairly prejudiced by information and evidence that would sway the jury in ways that would be unfair. Yeah, you remind us of the other uh, ruling that took place today. Indeed, the Access Hollywood tape will not be part of this trial. Jessica Roth, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining here on Bloomberg as we add the voice of Sarah Forden, who leads our legal uh, coverage here in Washington, D.C. She's made her way 
to New York for the trial as well. And it's great to have you here, Sarah. There are questions about the gag order that Donald Trump is facing after he spent the weekend posting about Michael Cohen, also likely to testify in this case, his former fixer, as they call him. Donald Trump posting on Truth Social, has disgraced attorney and felon Michael Cohen been prosecuted for lying? The judge will hear arguments about this. They're going to sort this out apparently on the 23rd of April. Sarah, what could this gag order turn into for Donald Trump? That's right. Um, and the judge is sort of taking these questions separately outside of the, the jury selection process. So um, this is uh, about whether or not Trump can criticize um, members of the court, witnesses, prosecutors. Um, the judge placed this gag order on him. If he violates it, the judge can then decide what kinds of sanctions he would issue. Um, in the previous case, the E.G. Carroll case, Trump was also under a gag order. The judge fined him several times, so fining is, is, a, is a possibility. But, um, you know, going down the road, if, if the judge doesn't feel that, that Trump is complying, he could cite him in contempt of court, and eventually there could be yeah. prison involved. So it can there's a, a range of, of sanctions that the judge can use depending on how things go. Two days after that, Sarah, and you don't need me to tell you, the Supreme Court will be hearing arguments in the immunity case that may or may not allow Jack Smith's uh, January 6th trial to proceed here in Washington, D.C. A lot is being made about the historical significance of this day, a former president on criminal trial for the first time. But is that, in fact, the more pivotal day for the legal future of Donald Trump? Well, actually, there was some drama about that very point um, at the end of the of the hearing today. And Trump is saying that he wants to be able to come to Washington on the 25th to be at the Supreme Court for those arguments. And Judge Merchant said, no, um, that's not going to happen. You are a defendant in this trial. You, by law, have to be here. You don't need to go to the Supreme Court. Fascinating. Sarah, thank you for helping us out. Sarah Forden uh, with us in New York here on Balance of Power. There's new urgency in Congress to fast track aid for Israel now following Iran's aerial assault over the weekend. As we toggle back and forth this hour between our two top stories, we want to bring in Bloomberg's Nancy Cook for more on this. Nancy, thanks for joining as always. This certainly heightens the urgency around funding for Israel. There's $14 billion in this supplemental emergency uh, spending bill that's already passed the Senate that appears to not have a future in the House. Uh, and Mike Johnson has some very difficult decisions to make here. Does he bring a standalone Israel bill back to the floor like that? Does he bring something combined with Ukraine? Those meetings, those conversations are taking place right now. Do we have any sense of where they lead? Well, I think that what he's trying to do is he's trying to tie Ukraine funding, but as a loan to the Israel funding mm -hmm. and pass that. He wants to create a new bill, but there is some pushback with Senate leaders, um, including Mitch McConnell, saying that will take too much time. Let's just go with the bill that we have. Yeah, right. But this is really like a rush to get Israel the money that they need, an ongoing debate in the Republican caucus over the future of Ukraine funding. And of course, over all of this hangs, uh, you know, the GOP nominee, Donald Trump, right. and how he is weighed in on this. You know, he has not been supportive of Ukraine funding in the past. Mm -hmm. He is supportive of Israel funding. But this is really something that Republicans, uh, you know, it's a live ball for them this week. Well, you're the perfect person to talk to about this because you were at Mar-a-Lago on Friday when Donald Trump and Mike Johnson were together. Uh, they certainly spoke about this. Speaker said on Sunday morning on Fox News that Donald Trump did favor more of a loan mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of funding for Ukraine. Uh, is that meeting what will lead to the legislation? Has it already been hammered out? Well, I think that that is what Trump made it clear, um, you know, even when he spoke in front of the, the press at Mar-a-Lago on Friday, that he wanted the Ukraine aid to be a loan. And even that was a little bit of an evolution for him, because in the past he has just said we should not be spending money on all these foreign policy policy crises. Now he's coming around to the loan. But I feel like if we see Johnson moving forward to that forward with Ukraine aid and successfully convincing other Republicans to do it, it yeah. will be in this loan form because that's what House Republicans are feeling comfortable with at this point. A loan, maybe the Repo Act is attached to that. We have yet to find that out. And questions, of course, about the motion to vacate hanging over Mike Johnson's head, whether uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene will follow through with that. I guess we'll learn that together. Nancy, thank you for being with us, as always. Bloomberg's Nancy Cook with us on Balance of Power. Coming up, we'll be joined by our political panel. 
With more details from the weekend and this important day in New York and Washington, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio, today marking the first day of Donald Trump's first criminal trial in New York, of course, to help take us through what happened inside and outside of the courthouse. It's been a long one. We turn to Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons, who's made her way to the courthouse in Manhattan. Kaylee, we saw the start of jury selection, but also some important rulings to set the table for this trial in the early going. Yeah, Joe, so what happened inside the courtroom was the judge had to rule on a number of motion, motions. One brought by the defense was a motion for recusal, and this judge, Juan Merchant, refused to recuse himself. There were also a number of motions related to what evidence could actually be brought uh, before the jury. There was perhaps wins for both the prosecution and defense in that process. On the prosecution side, you will be able to hear, or jurors will be able to hear testimony from Karen McDougal, the former Playboy model who allegedly had an affair with Donald Trump, but things like the Access Hollywood tape, the grab her by the tape that we all are familiar with from the 2016 election cannot be played for the jury. So it was a lot of those kinds of decisions before the actual jury selection process could get underway. And we have a long way to go in that process, Joe. Of course, they're looking for 12 jurors and six alternates who can be unbiased and impartial in assessing this case and the former president uh, in which it entails. And 96 initial jurors were brought into the courtroom. More than half of them said they could not be unbiased and impartial uh, and then were excused. We have no juror yet decided on uh, at this moment. Things will proceed again at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, here tomorrow. And then just on what happened outside the courthouse quickly, Joe, I would note that you had people both showing up for and against Donald Trump today. There were protesters here chanting, no one is above the law. Trump is not above the law. There were also Trump advocates uh, chanting, Donald Trump did nothing wrong. So really you saw how political uh, much of this has been uh, on full display and certainly saw it in Donald Trump's remarks as well as he cast this case as political persecution and what he says is something designed to keep him off the campaign trail. Yeah, that's for sure. Those of us, uh, those of you with us on Bloomberg TV seeing images from inside the courthouse, not a very happy looking Donald Trump. Kaylee, we've seen Trump spend a lot of time in a lot of courtrooms he did not need to be in over the past couple of months. It's different this time. He has to be there for four days a week, right? He'll be sleeping at Trump Tower during the weeks. Will he still be able to talk to the media every day? He can if he so desires, Joe, but you're absolutely right. He is a criminal defendant, so he has to be here in person for every day of this trial, which could keep him off the campaign trail, of course, but he has shown a track record of using courtroom appearances as de facto campaign events, seizing opportunity to attain the free media, speak not just to the press, but anyone who could potentially cast a vote for him in November. That certainly is something that paid off for him in the primaries, and that is why today we speak of him as the pre presumptive Republican nominee. But as we move closer to the general election, the equation could change depending on whether or not he actually ends up a convicted felon at the end of these proceedings. Of course, the polls Bloomberg has done with Morning Consult indicate that in the seven key swing states likely to decide the outcome of the election, more than half of voters say that they would not vote for Donald Trump if he were convicted of a crime, Joe. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons with us from the courthouse in Manhattan. Thank you, Kaylee. As we continue our coverage of the hush money trial, we assemble our Closers in this discussion, Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Ioni University, and Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital. We'll call them closers, I guess, at the end of the show. Uh, it's great to have you both with us here. Rick, we've talked so much about time spent in the courtroom to Donald Trump's benefit. You've suggested that might start to change now. I just would love to tap your experience as a campaign manager. How do you have a candidate locked in a courthouse for four days a week and run for president? Yeah, it's very difficult. I, it's, not, it's never happened, right, in the history of our country. Uh, and so I think that's one of the things you have to contemplate is we don't know what the reaction to the public's going to be. Uh, as Kaylee was talking about, he, he'll have a shot in the mornings maybe to talk to the public, and then yeah. he's locked into the courtroom. Uh, the campaign will pump out activity and information during the day. I'm sure they'll ramp it up. Uh, much like a president on vacation, they try to show the administration's doing things. I'm sure this will be the same way. Uh, but at the end of the day, he's not traveling to targeted states, right? So those key six or seven targeted swing states are not going to see him other than on weekends or a Wednesday night. Uh, and then on top of that, 
we don't know how long this trial is going to go, right? Yeah, I mean, the judge true. said today, it's already behind schedule, that's and right. it's day one. Uh, and so uh, two weeks to six weeks to eight weeks to, you know, three months, who knows? And so this could be a permanent summer camp that uh, Donald Trump has to attend. And, and, and I think all the polls talk about whether or not you would uh, withhold your support for Donald Trump if he's convicted. But how about watching this day in and day out? Mm -hmm. Doesn't the public come up to their own decision as to whether you're guilty or innocent? And do they really need a jury to tell them that at the end to make up their mind as to whether they're supporting for president? So I think we're going to see this evolve. Uh, pollsters are going to have a field day with this. And uh, I think we'll be uh, seeing a new kind of campaign uh, and hopefully the last time. Uh, fascinating, Jeannie. What does the Biden campaign do all the while? This is six to eight weeks that we're talking about here. Is there nuance for Joe Biden or do you set up a war room and remind everybody every day about what happened in court? Yeah, there's been some debate on exactly how they should do this. You know, there's been one side which says they should be actively out there, more aggressively talking about this, and others who say we should counter program. We should show the mm -hmm. president at work doing the business of the people. And I think they've decided, and we saw this today when he was asked, you know, is he going to be watching the trial and all of that, and, and he sort of nodded no, um, that they are going to be counter programming. But I do think there is a question here about what is the best way to handle this, because they do have to keep reminding people what we are talking about, that this is somebody, if convicted, who will be a felon on the ballot running for president. So I do sort of side with that first school that says they should be a little more aggressive on this. But I think for now they're going to counter program and let people just watch Donald Trump's chaos play out in this Manhattan courtroom. When you think of the optics here, Rick, campaigns are supposed to be based on optimism, right? A vision for the future. People are going to see that scowl. He looked very angry today. He was striding into the courtroom, looking angry, sitting in the, uh, in the witness box or in the defendant's uh, table, looking angry. In some cases, falling asleep today. Those are not the optics you would associate uh, with a positive campaign. How do you manage that? Yeah, well, first of all, Donald Trump is not running an optimism campaign, right? He is running a full-on pessimism campaign. Retribution. He's, he's, it's retribution. It's the country's a disaster. All this is an attack on you, not so me. So is this on brand? I'm just the victim standing in for the American people. Uh, so this is on brand. Uh, it's not inconsistent with anything we've seen. In fact, I got a whole slew of texts from the Trump campaign today, and one of them was <laughs> entitled... We know you're angry. <laughs> okay. And like, okay, well, you know, I'm angry because I keep getting these texts. That's what's making me mad. Uh, but at the end of the day, this follows into his strategy that the country is in dismal disarray, that uh, all these international events could have been cured by just his presence. Uh, and so, uh, but again, how long does that last? How long does that, you know, uh, keep going to the point where he can uh, satisfy his base but then how do you get new people into that campaign? How do you convince folks that the country's on its last leg and that sitting in a courtroom is actually an act of patriotism and defiance, not of being a criminal? Yeah, sure. And once it tips a criminal, it's very hard to get it to tip back. Jeannie, you're in New York, liberal New York, where Donald Trump says he cannot get a fair trial. They kicked a lot of people out today, <laughs> starting with 500 looking uh, for uh, a, a, an unbiased panel of individuals in Manhattan who can somehow get through this trial. Is it possible? It's absolutely possible. You know, they are looking for people, you know, you don't have to never have heard of Donald Trump, certainly, or have no view on him. But what you have to be able to do is to convince the judge and the lawyers that you are willing to be a fair person in terms of hearing both sides and coming to a fair conclusion. And, you know, I would just add on to what you were talking about that, you know, while this is unprecedented for us in the United States, this trope that Donald Trump is using of being personal 
persecuted is used around the world successfully. So I think we have to be very careful about assuming that this is not going to engender him to some supporters because it has worked in the past remarkably so. And I would just point to Pakistan with Imran Khan, who has become more popular after he says he was persecuted and thrown in jail where he sits today. So this is something that's been used around the world by strong men. It can be used successfully. So there's no saying how this will turn out. All right, Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis, our signature panel, will be back with us straight ahead on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg TV and Radio. The United States has never before so extensively and so directly defended Israel from attack. <clears throat> to ensure that that continues to be the case, the House of Representatives must urgently pass the National Security Supplemental, which has already passed the Senate. Passing that bill is the fastest and surest way to get Israel the aid it needs. That was John Kirby, National Security Council coordinator. Earlier today, back with us now, our panel, Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University, and Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital. Jeannie, the administration here uh, feels the urgency of the moment and hoping to turn this into action on Capitol Hill. Republican leaders uh, are meeting, and the Republican conference now added to that meeting just as of uh, a couple of moments ago to try to map out a way forward when it comes to funding for not only Israel, but also Ukraine. Will Democrats accept these in standalone fashion? I know Joe Biden sent an emergency funding request that puts them all together, and it's passed the Senate. But the Speaker of the House doesn't seem very willing to bring that to the floor. Will Democrats vote yes for a standalone Israel funding bill if they know Ukraine is coming? You know, I think Kirby is right when he says the fastest way to do this is to pass the Senate bill. Whether, in fact, Johnson can get that done, I think, is the big question. And if they decide to go the way of the separate individual bills and then allow the Senate to couple them together if more than one passes, you know, hopefully they would get the Democratic support on that because the aid is desperately needed. So the fastest way to do this is the Senate bill. But again, we don't have have confidence or know yet whether in fact that will pass and if Mike Johnson quite frankly is willing to put his job on the line to take a chance on that. Does it matter Rick? I know there was a narrative around this being uh, all put into one piece of national security legislation but my goodness months have gone by and you know what kind of uh, opposition we've heard from certain members of the Republican conference. Why not bring them all one by one? Yeah, look, I mean, it's been very distorted since the first time, you know, the president submitted this package as a border security package for the right. world, right? How true. Uh, for Ukraine, for uh, for the Taiwanese, for uh, uh, for Israel, and for the United States. We have border funds in that package. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they overthought it maybe a little bit because it, it, it got adjusted in the Senate, but still a, a package together. This is all about the, the, the Freedom Caucus and their disruptive tactics within the Republican caucus. They've been more successful than not. Uh, they're likely to be more successful tonight. So if they demand that it gets carved up, uh, then that's likely to be what spits out of the House. And at this stage, I think there's so much frustration that uh, those people who want to see funding, which is over 300 members of the House of Representatives, for every one of these titles uh, are just going to say, fine, just put the <laughs> bill on the floor and let's vote on it, right? Yeah. Let's send it to the Senate passed in the House of Representatives by 300 plus members mm -hmm. and call it a day because at this stage you don't have the leadership in the speaker's office to counteract the minority within the Republican caucus that wants to cause trouble. Sure. So just take a vote. It's likely he's going to have to work around the rules here. Uh, Jeannie, if that's the case, if he suspends the rules, do Democrats show up to pass all of these? You know, I think they will. But one aspect of this from the Democratic perspective that we should underscore is that the passage of the Israeli aid without conditions is, in my mind, at least not a sure thing. I mean, we are looking today in San Francisco at huge demonstrations 
demonstrations, closing the bridge, people, ch you know, chained right. together. I mean, this is what people are seeing around the country, and these members are going to be asked to vote on that. So I think if the bill is for Israel, at least with no conditions, that might be harder to pass, you know. And of course, if, if you know, you get a chance to read, and I'm sure you did, Joe, Bernie Sanders' editorial on support for Israel, if that gets to the Senate separately. Those kinds of questions yeah. for Democrats are very, very real. I agree with Rick. There's lots of support for Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan, but there are nuances here on both sides that may make this more difficult than we expect. We only have 30 seconds here, Rick. If you're a Ukraine hawk, you want money to go to Kyiv. Do you prefer these to be separate for that reason? to not run the risk of progressive Democrats voting no? Yeah, I think the only thing that matters if you're a Ukraine hawk is speed. What's the fastest way we can get money and an armament to Ukraine? And I'd take that path over any other. You take whatever vote you get. Exactly. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano, a great conversation after a complicated weekend. Coming up, we'll be joined by former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Kurt Volker, for a deeper discussion on Israel and the Middle East. It's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Iran needs the funding cut from them, and Israel needs U.S. funding now. We have the ability in Congress to move that forward. Now, there is a conversation about a compendium of supporting our allies here. I have uh, very much supported our allies in this region. But let's be clear about what is the most direct need, and that is the ability to resupply Israel today for the weapon systems that kept it safe. Iowa Republican Congressman Zach Nunn on the early edition of Balance of Power today as we now add the voice of former U.S. Ambassador to NATO and former Special Representative for Ukraine negotiations, Kurt Volker. Mr. Ambassador, it's great to have you. Thank you for joining us. It does appear that we're finally at the threshold of a vote in the U.S. House to fund Ukraine as well as Israel. And we've been having a conversation here today about whether that should look like the bill that passed the Senate, that which was supported by Joe Biden, or if they should be voted on in individual chunks. The Speaker of the House is going to let us know likely before the day is out here. Does it matter for your specialty, Ukraine? You know, I, I think Rick Davis in your previous segment called it. It's whatever gets it done fastest. That's all we want is just get the uh, assistance to these nations out the door as quickly as possible because lives are on the line in both countries. What's really striking is the similarity of what's happening. The, the drone and missile attacks against Israel, 300 of them in one night, very similar to what Russia does to Ukraine almost every night, even with the same weapons. There are Iranian drones in both cases. And so they both of them need the air defense systems to be able to protect themselves. And in terms of uh, Ukraine, I have no doubt that this is going to pass massively. The, the, there's a vast majority of congressmen, both parties, who support aid to Ukraine. Just a matter of getting it to the floor. And whether that's coupled with Israel or separate from Israel, I don't think it's going to matter as, because I think the Ukraine aid will, will pass. I think it was John Kirby who... Uh earlier described that Saturday night in the skies over Israel as being every night in the skies over Ukraine. Ambassador, can we take the experience of last weekend, considering the urgency of the moment, and apply it to both scenarios? Absolutely, because it is exactly the same circumstance. It is an aggressor, Russia in one case, Iran in another, deliberately attacking the civilian population of another country uh, with drones, with missiles, uh, with rockets, and uh, they need the ability to defend themselves. One of the interesting things is that in the case of Israel, the U.S. and U.K. and France and Jordan all joined in to help Israel defend itself against this Iranian attack. We're not doing that in the case of Ukraine, and it's a good question as to why. Why are we not protecting Ukrainian civilians the way we're protecting Israeli civilians? We should do both. Uh, but at a minimum, we should get the funding passed to get the equipment out the door so that uh, Ukraine has the uh, air defense missiles to refill the battery so they can protect their citizens uh, just as Israel is protecting its. 
Well, we saw two squadrons of American fighter pilots flying F-15s, shooting down missiles that were on their way uh, to targets in Israel. Ambassador, are you suggesting that we should do the same over Ukraine? I, I don't see why we shouldn't, because the, the, the parallel is the same. These are unmanned missiles, unmanned drones that are going to kill civilians. Uh, we have the ability to do this. It's not threatening anybody. It's purely a humanitarian gesture to protect lives. Uh, so I don't see why we wouldn't be willing to do that. And it doesn't have to be aircraft and pilots. Uh, there are air defense systems, Patriot missile systems, other systems that can be used to augment what Ukraine is already able to do. And same thing with Israel. Uh, we should continue doing what we're doing to protect Israel. Well, that would be quite a development. We were afraid to even provide F-16s, uh, my goodness, to suggest that American fighter pilots might be uh, directly involved, even if it's an unmanned aircraft. Wouldn't that be escalatory in the eyes of Russia? Uh, well, in the eyes of Russia, perhaps. But Russia is doing everything it can to take over Ukraine. The Ukrainians are fighting for their lives. Uh, we have to recognize yep. that this is a war for them. It's a war of survival. And it's also a brutal war crime that Russia is engaged in, both crime of aggression as well as this deliberate attacks on civilians every night. Ambassador, we've heard a lot about a closing window in Ukraine. We know that they're running short on ammunition and on money. Even if this gets passed today, it's going to take time to make the shells and in some cases the missiles that they need to defend themselves. How much time does Ukraine really have? Well, uh, first off, I would like to think that our military has made preparations so that they will have put the stuff on pallets, packaged it up, have it in Poland perhaps already, so it is ready to be uh, deployed as quickly as possible. We're just waiting for the budget authority. That's what I would like to think is already happening. And as far as yeah. Ukraine goes, it's, it's twofold. Um, they are losing ground on the front lines little by little already because they don't have the ammunition to push back. So it's maybe a ratio of 1 to 10 in terms of artillery or even 1 to 12 okay. is what I heard recently. That's one problem. But then the other is that Ukraine is going to fight to defend itself, its capital city, Kiev, the people, the population, in yes, whatever right. means they have to. So including guerrilla warfare, if it ends up being that, they're not going to be giving up on their own freedom. Kurt Volker, great to see you, Mr. Ambassador. Thanks for the time today, as always, here on Balance of Power. We urge you to check out the Washington Edition newsletter. If you want the latest on the stories that we've been talking about over the past hour, you can find it on the terminal and online with the best of Bloomberg's reporting. And we thank you for joining us. For Kaylee Lines in New York, I'm Joe Matthew. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.